Hello, I am interviewing Maria Sutton. Okay, I wasn't sure quite how to pronounce it. It's probably not the first person or the last person. Uh, she is a chaplain at St. Tim's, Timothy's Episcopal Church in Brookings, a place that has faced much controversy for, because of its remarkable ways in which it tries to help those who are struggling. Could you tell a little about your background and then what you do here at St. Tim's? Yeah, so I am actually a chaplain in training. I'm in a uh, special program uh, that is sponsored by uh, the Episcopalian Church. And I have been a member of this congregation since about the first Right after the pandemic started, when they gave us those checks, they sent out those checks from the government, those $1,600 checks, I brought a donation to the church to, to help because I didn't think that people like me should be getting that kind of money and we should give it back to the community. Uh, so I brought some a donation here and they asked me, well, it's Wednesday and we have a service, why don't you stay? And I stayed, and that was the beginning of my journey with St. Timothy. So um, so I've been doing various things with St. Timothy's. I worked in the COVID clinic when we had that. That's where I got my clinic. shots. Yes. And um, I've also am on the guild, the altar guild that sets up for church on Sundays. I do that once a month. And... Now, uh, I actually had a um, spiritual experience is the only way to describe it. I've got a tree on my property and I call it my prayer tree. And um, I was praying and I got a direct message. Why don't you see about going into the chaplaincy program? Wow. And um, you need to be a chaplain and you need to be a chaplain at St. Timothy's. And, you know, at first I was going, well, why am I getting these thoughts and what is this? And, and so then I looked online and I found this program and then Deacon Linda said, oh yeah, Kurt Nelson, Father Kurt Nelson, he, he's the um, supervisor diplomate. He does the program. Uh, and then Father Bernie's wife, oh yeah, I went through the chaplaincy program and I started looking at the information and, and it, it, it was so well connected, but I didn't know that until that, what happened at the tree. How did the tree communicate? It wasn't the tree, it's just where I go to pray, right? Okay. I call it the prayer tree because it's on our property and it's where I go to pray. And I was praying and I just had this calling. Yeah. And so um, so I got a hold of, of the program and it's actually the, I can tell you what it's called. It's Clinical Pastoral Education, okay. and it's with the Episcopal Church for Western Oregon, and it's the College of Pastoral Supervision and Psychotherapy. It covers a lot of range. <laughs> yes, it does, and I always have to look it up, <laughs> especially the other part. And uh, it's a wonderful program. We, um, we meet once a week on Mondays and Tuesdays. That's why I was going, wait, today's Monday. I thought we weren't meeting because of Thanksgiving and I was checking and we're okay. not meeting. Okay. But we meet every Monday and Tuesday and then uh, we get support for our work. And uh, this is unique. I mean, uh, Deacon Linda also served when she was in the chaplaincy program. She also did her intern here. Um, and I'm the second one, I guess. And so this is usually uh, chaplains serve in settings like Good Samaritan hospitals or, or in hospitals or, um, but serving in a congregation to serve those who are, uh, uh, housing insecure and those who, um, have, have other, you know, income insecure, uh, and with our congregants, that's a unique setting for chaplains. So it's just very, uh, very, what's the word, spiritual. <laughs> okay. It just really is. It's quite the, quite the amazing experience, actually. If I may add a quote, and I'm not sure if I have it exactly right, but the French Roman Catholic philosopher, 
Jacques Maritain, I believe the name was, once said, bread for oneself is a personal issue, bread for one's neighbor is a spiritual issue. And I frankly have never seen any congregation take that so seriously. They reach out with compassion. They're not trying to recruit and evangelize in a, no, a way. No, and but that's an important point. That's an important point. Part of the chaplaincy intern is we absolutely do not proselytize. We do not. We do not. Um, we do not try to convert people. We don't have conditions. Oh, if we help you, you need to come to church. And we do not do that. But uh, those that walk through this door that need help, uh, we help them to the best of our ability. There's no no strings attached. There's no. Uh, if there's no proselytizing. In fact, that's against the bylaws of this chaplaincy program. You, you, could, you do not do that. And so I want to make that clear. There's no, there's sure. this just, um, and my work has really led to mainly working with women. Okay. And um, a lot of, uh, and women across, across ages, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think the public at large really understands that those who live uh, housing insecure you know, either in their cars or those that are don't have any shelter at all, uh, range a wide range of ages. People tend to think, oh, it's men on the streets with their signs. And uh, actually, I serve women from young women with children all the way through women in their 70s. I've worked with, and um, and literally, what it is is um, having conversations, right? It's seeing and being and being heard. And so we often come into this church because this is um, a place where I absolutely feel, absolutely feel the Holy Spirit. And so we come in here and a lot of times we sit right here <laughs> and we, and we just talk. And usually it starts out with, well, Father Bernie wanted me to talk with you, have time with you. And I really, you know, I really don't have anything to, to say or to tell you. And I sit with them. And next thing you know, we're talking. And um, it's so, it always ends with um, hugs, usually, because literally just having someone listen to you and value you <laughs> and spend time with you and believe in you is um, cathartic for women. And then the other things that happen is, so my role here is not as one of the advocates. My role here is as chaplain. But what I do is as we have these conversations and needs come up or I get concerned about something, well, then I go to our team, right? And uh, share whatever the specific need is. And the advocacy team deals with things like getting identification and getting identification, uh, getting uh, gas, helping people get back home, uh, getting uh, helping people navigate to get better shelter. Um, a lot of times, I call it going shopping. I take them down, um, help them get clothes, food. We have a, a food pantry downstairs. And besides the, um, the meals that we and other churches provide uh, for a meal a day, we also have a pantry that has dried goods, et cetera, in it. So I'll take women down, especially I've done that with women with families, and we go shopping, <laughs> right? We, we fill up a bag with, uh, with food that is uh, navigable, uh, easy to, to to work with and um, and then you know people are always bringing in clothing we we work hard to keep people clothed in warm clothes especially in uh, the winter it's a real issue dry feet we see people come in with you know they'll have uh, their feet will be a mess because they've been wet yes. for um, days and so uh, bomba socks Hello, this is a continuation of an interview with Maria Suddeth, uh, who is a chaplain in training at St. Timothy's Church here in Brookings. And uh, we w would like to ask her a bit about what's it quite mean to be in training as a, a chaplain? Okay. 
Okay. And maybe a little about your background before that. Okay. So. Uh, well, you know, um, so a little bit of a, an interesting thing that happened today that kind of speaks to this. I uh, listened to um, uh, la an app during Lent season, uh -huh. and it's called hallow.com, uh, and it's like a 10-minute prayer. Devotional time. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And um, this morning, at the, they were talking about um, if you're trying to save your life, you will lose it. If you're trying and, or trust in God, and you will find it. And asked us to meditate and ask um, how um, I can surrender myself to you. And in that process, when I was meditating, I got this message that you have been prepared for this. And so what that made me think about, I've had some, um, oh, I don't know, some uh, feedback or different things that um, I might have too much attachment to the families I work with. And, you know, maybe I'm out of the scope of what I should be doing, but I got that message today and what it made it be think about, there's a big difference between I prepared for this and I have been prepared for this. Okay. So that was the message I got today was you have been prepared for this. So um, what that makes me think about, I started teaching when I was uh, 37 in 1992. Okay, so I worked with third, fourth and fifth graders um, mainly uh, in bilingual setting, mainly kids who were um, from migrant families. Mm -hmm. And I did that for 10 years. And then I went to Chico State and worked with uh, student teachers in the bilingual program. And those were pretty much all first generation college students. Mm -hmm. So um, in both of those settings, there was a lot of working with families who were uh, marginalized or on you know, that, that um, needed, well, needed is the wrong word. Uh, I was able to work with families and develop relationships where um, they were seen and heard and, um, you know, nurtured along the way, I guess. So nurtured in a way that uh, met with the student teachers all the time. And if, uh, if there were any struggles, financial or any of those kinds of things, I would be able to connect them to resources that supported them, help them, and, um, you know, had several wonderful graduations where, with their families where we had prepared these young first generation teachers to go out and carry forth the work, right? Mm -hmm. So I did that, and then in 2014, I retired from that and went to work for an organization called National Urban Alliance, a nonprofit. And that was, again, working with um, schools that had a high percentage of, um, of you know, economically disadvantaged families. And so we provided support for their teachers for good strategies, ways to teach children that would engage them and um, be very student-centered. So I did that. <laughs> and then in during the pandemic, I, when we all got those checks, you know, my family didn't need those checks. So I came to St. Tim's, I decided to support um, different um, uh, organizations that were supporting those who were unhoused. And so I came here with a check on a Wednesday and it was right before they were starting their service. And I wanna say that was uh, 2019, I wanna say. Um, could have been 2020, but time goes, it probably was 2020, time goes okay. so fast I can't keep track. But at any rate, um, Father Bernie said she came and she stayed. <laughs> so I went to the service that day and um, I never looked back and then did different things, you know, helped with the COVID clinic and joined the altar guild and um, because around here, as you well know, um, we really believe in um, faith through action. We really believe that, uh, you know, you lean into what Jesus would do and you live that life. So what would Jesus do? And, and that's how we live. 
So here I did COVID clinic and then last year during the, um, when we had uh, the help for when it was so cold, when it was snowing and all that. Um, no, before that, before that I did one-on-one -on -one interviews with different people who were unhoused to help them get into uh, a warming shelter that we had mm -hmm. for uh, a few weeks that we didn't have actually, CORE had. And that was the first time that I was in a position where I was talking to um, those who were unhoused one-on-one, -on -one, right? So it's a completely different experience for people when you see, you know, oh, I want to help the unhoused, or oh, it's Thanksgiving, I'm going to go help serve a meal during Thanksgiving. You know, I'm, you know, it's during the holidays, I'm going to buy a present for Toys for Tots. To actually meet people one-on-one -on -one and learn their life story and make that kind of connection changed me. So, you know, and I know that Father Bernie knew exactly what he was doing when he asked me to interview people for that, for the warming shelter, yeah. because it did change me. It the, changed the projection of my life. This was part of the advocacy group here at yes. St. Tim's. Mm -hmm. Yes, and he had asked me to, to, to help out uh, and do some interviews on, to help people fill out the application online and do these interviews. So I did that, and then from there I worked, we had a um, day-long warming well, actually, we, it wasn't a warming, it wasn't called a warming shelter, but uh, we were able to provide all day and um, overnight during that really bad storm. Is that going to screw you up? Is that screwing you up? The first, it sounded like there was vacuuming going on, That's and now there sounds right. like a radio going on. I, Is it going to hurt uh, your process? Let's stop. Hello, we had to move in our interview because there was some noise above us that was... Was it above us or below us? Above us. Above us. That was uh, just sounded like a vacuum cleaner and a radio. So we moved to the sacristy here, which hopefully is a little more quiet. So hopefully that this works. Yeah. So um, so we were where I was interviewing people for the warming shelter, and then I started working, and it wasn't called a warming shelter, but it was a place where people could get out of the snow, get mm -hmm. out of the cold, and so um, that was. The next step for me, I guess, was when I was uh, taking care of people throughout the day at the, to keep them here, uh -huh. where they could be warm, and then they transferred to uh, um, another facility to sleep at night. So that was the first time that I really um, started interacting even more with um, families, and even more, not with families, more with uh, just uh, men and, and women who were needing to get out of the cold. And then from there... I um, moved into uh, thinking about, well, actually, again, I got this very clear call to, um, I want you to be a chaplain. And I thought, well, what is this? I have at home, I've got this um, prayer tree, I call it. Uh -huh. And that's where I go to meditate and pray. And um, I was out at the prayer tree and I got this just very clear message, you know, I I want you to be a chaplain. And I thought, wow, I don't even know what is involved with that or what that is. And and at that same time, the, um, the diocese, West Coast Diocese has a chaplaincy program and uh, Father Bernie's wife has gone through it. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know how or why, but I found the link online and then I found uh, Paige's testimony that day about the chaplaincy program. Okay. And she had just put it in there that day. Wow. That very day. Yeah. And so um, I just kept getting these little micro messages that, you know, this is what you need to do. And I had some pretty significant hurdles to this work um, before I started it. I was taking care of a, a family member um, that was pretty all encompassing. And also I had some other things in my family. And I thought, I just don't know if I can do this. You know, I don't know if I can really commit to this with the kind of commitment it needs, well, those, uh, those um, issues were resolved. Right. And they you know, said, okay, well, we're going to get those out of the way, so now what? Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, you know, I was kind of insecure about it, but I stayed with it because I kept getting this strong feeling that it's something I needed to do. So I interviewed and started the process. So it's a, um, it's a 
four year program if I go through all four years. But um, right now I'm looking to at the first two years, which is what I would need to continue volunteer. Actually, I would just need this year, but, um, but I want the two years because I want more in-depth learning involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and the training is very much uh, focused on, it was meant originally for uh, chaplains as we know them, you know, in hospitals and, hospitals and, and, and institutional hospitals settings, yeah. Institutional settings. This is um, kind of like a pilot program where to look to expand chaplaincy into to parishes, into uh, church settings that do this kind of work. And so, um, so we have embraced on this. It's throughout this year. I work here Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I have classes Monday and Tuesday, um, and then I'm going to on Zoom. Or, yes, yeah. on Zoom, and but they're wonderful classes. I don't know if you know Gabor Mate is one of the authors. The books we read are very um, in depth, and they very much focus on on marginalized and otherwise population, and how to best work with them. I'm fairly recent to the world of Episcopalians, and I must say that I'm so impressed that they're very serious about training, uh, not only for their clergy, but also their deacons and their and their uh, chaplains and and other people, and and uh, teaching good listening skills, and also avoiding this kind of mentality of we are trying to get someone to join our church. Exactly Would you care that. to comment about that? Exactly. In fact, that's right in the bylaws. Uh -huh. you, you are not to proselytize. Yes. It's right there that that's not what we're about. And so, um, and it very much is around listening skills, you know, reflective listening. It's very much about that. You know, it's about um, self-actualization. It's about meeting people right where they are and honoring them for who they are and 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 you know listening to them and and working with them i mean it's um i mean my role there's different roles here we have an advocacy team and a and a case manager and we have an attorney and and different things their role is different than my role my role is really um when i come in i i, I literally just start scouting around and looking for someone that might want to talk to me and then from those conversations, you know, it might be, okay, they need to, they need to um, talk to, you know, case manager, or they just need someone to listen to them, or, or they just want to be seen and be heard, or, or, you know, they need some temporary help that maybe we can help them with, or they need more long-term sustainable help, well, how can we connect them to the different organizations and agencies that, that work people with people. You know, if they're working through, um, you know, for instance, I work a lot with uh, families mm -hmm. with uh, right now, which is another thing about this work. For whatever reason, we've had several moms with children come through. And for young children. Yes, yes, with young children, under four. And uh, that's happened since I've been here. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with about... Ten families with uh, moms, children, you know, and and you know, husbands, significant others. But that seems to be the direction that my work is really going: is working with that population. I, I find it really ironic that this church is trying so hard to really meet people in need, and where yet it's <laughs> where they are, and and in remarkable ways of connecting them with what they need to be connected to, and yet it's become a, a subject of controversy in the community, and especially with the strange people who seem to be selected to somehow get on the city council and, and uh, leadership in, of the city. Do you have any comments on that? I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, the um, series The Chosen is really popular right now. Do you know what that is? No. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's really good, <laughs> but it's a um, series that that uh, chronicles Jesus's ministry, uh -huh. and um, I'm in season two right now, and it's the same thing, right? I mean, it's the exact same thing. I, Jesus was out doing this work. I mean, I'm not helping people get up and walk or <laughs> things like that. But he 
he was out doing this work. He was working with the marginalized. He was working with those living in poverty. He was working with those that, that, um, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees looked down on. And yeah. he got in trouble for it. And he was he confronting went, people about their... He was confronting people about their hypocrisy about, and, and about... feelings about the poor. That's yeah. right. And, and so to me, a theme in my life is what would Jesus do? You know, pretty recent, since 2020, I was raised Catholic, but I had a rebirth, I guess, into my beliefs um, through because of this church. Mm -hmm. And because Father Bernie always says... We need to lean into Jesus. We need to lean into what Jesus would do. And, um, you know, we need to act on our faith. And that, to me, is was his work, Jesus' work. And that's what we're doing here. So, of course, comes with that. Of course, comes with that, the, the pushback from those that look at those living in poverty as less than. And they just want that population just to go away. Move and to the next no town. different from then than it is now. And to me, that's my guide. I like and say, well, you know, we know how things went with that. So it's just, you know, you just have to trust in the process and, and think one person at a time, regardless of all of that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Right on time.